Hello there and good morning everyone. Good morning Sabbath School. Welcome once again to the FWP Center Sabbath School broadcast panel. We are streaming live this morning on the FWP YouTube channel and the FWP um, Center website. Thank you so much for joining. We look forward to coming to share God's word with you morning after morning. And um, this week was an interesting week, very interesting. We celebrated Teachers um, Week. We celebrated uh, Nurses Week. And we want to just recognize all our nurses, all our healthcare workers, and our teachers um, during this week from the FWP Center, the First Seventh day Adventist Church of White Plains. We want you to know that we stand with you, we celebrate with you. And then this weekend, we are celebrating our mothers. So, happy Mother's Day to all our mothers from the FWP Center. We are delighted to be here this morning again. I love to see those smiling faces from our panels. We want you to take a moment right now and just call your friend. And we can you can send them the link that we send out to you. Or let your friend know that you are watching and we are live on air. And we will be blessed this morning as we study again from the Adult Sabbath School Lesson Guide, Lesson Number 6 entitled Abraham's Seed. Let me go ahead and introduce to you those who we will be interacting with this morning. And I say interact because I want you to interact with us while we discuss the lesson online. With us this morning is Dr. Bukat Murray. Good morning, Dr. Janine Bukat Murray. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. God bless. Thank you so much and welcome again. We have our own elder Dalbert Watson. We just love to have Dalbert Watson on with us. Good morning, Watson. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. God bless you, elder. And we have Pastor Ivor Richardson with that beautiful smile. Good morning, Pastor. <laughs> good morning, uh, Elder Webb, and good morning to all the panel members. Good morning to our congregation and all our listeners, local and worldwide. Happy Sabbath. Amen. Amen. So Sabbath is not Sabbath. Sabbath school is not Sabbath school without our church pastor, Dr. Sean Dowding. Good morning to you, Bishop. Good morning, Elder, and good morning to everyone. Welcome to this moment. All right. Thank you all so much. Behind the scenes is um, Elder Kirk McDonald, who is our technical engineer. He does a great job, and we are just so happy for you, Elder. Thank you so much, and continue to do God's work in this uh, humble way so again we have a memory verse which is taken from first peter 2 and verse 9 we are studying lesson number six abraham's seed um but before we begin let us pray let us pray loving god and our father we are so grateful for another beautiful sabbath day we're grateful god for the fact that you have preserved our lives to, to be here we invite and invoke your presence among us as we study your words. God, we pray that we will see you anew and fall in love all over again with you. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers, we pray. For Christ's sake, amen. Amen. So we have a lot to cover this morning. Elder Watson, the memory, says, memory verse says, but ye are a chosen generation. I love mm. that. A royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called you out. And I love that part. Called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter 2 verse 9. Elder Watson, why is it for Israel and even us today. It is such a nice thing to be called out, but to show forth the praises is not so welcoming. What's going on here? Oh. <laughs> um, and I like how you put it, Ella. Um, you know, God chose Israel for a mission. You know, Israel is not the chosen frozen. They are called to do a job. And, um, and unfortunately, as we, you know, get through the lesson, we realize that they did not fulfill the obligation. But the fact that they were called out and they were peculiar, I want to just spend a minute on the peculiar. They, they, he didn't call them to be odd people because sometimes we interpret peculiar to be odd. 
right? But he called them out to say, you know what? You are, you are dear and near. You are my possession. And therefore, go now and shine for me. Mm. A pastor? Well, we have two pastors. <laughs> well, you you need to specify. <laughs> well, let, let, let me allow um, Pastor Richardson to make a comment. And so I'm thinking of the concept called out. And Elder Webb, I need to tell you that being called out isn't necessarily always a good thing. I think of uh, growing up in the Caribbean where if you don't do your lessons, uh, the teacher will call you <laughs> and put a dunce cap on your head and put you in a corner. It's a bad thing. But when God calls you out, that's a precious thing. And so God calls us from our dark and groping in the darkness, calls us out from our ways that are the ways of sin. Uh, the scripture says there's a way that seemed right to man or woman, but the ends there are are the ways of destruction. And so we have to realize that our way leads to destruction. And so God calls us from the darkness into his marvelous light. And through the light of Christ, we're able to shine and the, those around us, not only those who are saved, but even the unsaved can see our shine because it's not our shine. It's really Christ is shining through us. And so that light attracts men and women. And so we are living examples and we ought to walk circumspect. We ought to remember that we are peculiar people in that sense because we're in the world, but not of it. We're sojourners through this world. And because of that, uh, we have to be careful not to develop or accept the ways of the world. And so we have to remember a royal priest or the chosen people anointed by God and set apart for God's use and purpose. Amen. Amen. The pastor um, Dowden, then Dr. Yeah. Murray, I'll come let you chime in right there after. <laughs> I think, you know, Pastor Richardson said it very well, and I'll just sum it up in a sentence that it is more important the purpose for which we are called than the calling itself because many are called but few are chosen Amen. but it's the purpose for the call that makes it important when we appropriate when we take unto ourselves the purpose of our calling as pastor richardson rightly summed up thank you dr murray on mute <laughs> The, <clears throat> the calling out a, a chosen generation, that is really powerful. I mean, the, the, you know, we know the story that God called out this people who were really poor, weak, really nothing, but because he chose them and called them out. Uh, and I, I agree, it was totally for the purpose. God needed a place to put information about him and the knowledge of him and his glory and what he would do for the world. And he called out this people to serve a mission in this world. And, and the remnant comes from that people. Thank you, Dr. Murray. So, um, you know, Dalbert, it, 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 like, the, like the story in, that we looked at in the introduction of the lesson about this clock that was in the jewelry window, jeweler's window, it stopped. There's a song that says, failure isn't final with the Father. Miles Monroe says, Without, um, where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Pastor made, uh, um, uh, uh, um, talked about that. So what we see here, Elder, is that even though Israel have failed, or were failing, there, there was still hope. There was still something else that could you know the, the, the revive re, 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 revitalization or something is that how does does that affect us today how what does that mean to us today um today's israel um very good point ella you know um when we recognize with the clock that fails to perform its duty it has colossal um effect not only by the clock itself but for those who are looking towards the clock telling the time like israel we are the clock. I think Ezekiel put that we are we are like the, the, the men on the walls are supposed to be telling the time. That they and if we refuse to execute that duty, it not only have effect on us, but those who expect to hear. So there is a dimension beyond ourselves. And we see Israel failure impacted the nation. But as you rightly said, 
our failure will not deter God's promise and purpose of bringing salvation to the world. Yes, it's an opportunity to shine for Christ, but our failure will not prevent God from shining to the world. Amen, amen, amen. So, Pastor Dowden, when we talk about above all, we are talking about the Lord specifically had chosen the Hebrew people to be his special representatives as priests, as valued property. These are some of the words that describe the people, his peculiar treasure upon the earth. Why did God choose Israel and why were they so special? Well, to be honest, nothing was special about them. <laughs> um, God found people who would be willing to cooperate with him. And within the people of God, we must remember that we had a whole bunch that had gone astray. So God was seeking to find people who would collaborate in faith and believe in him. You know, and, 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 and as you think of the picture and roll out the film, you will recognize that God knows the end from the beginning to the end. God knows what everyone is going to do. But yet God works within the willingness and the free will power of each person. So because God knows how this person will end up in the present, God is working with that person so that the person has enough to make the right choices. And so Israel had enough, was chosen, not because God wanted them to be full of pride and, and spiritual pride and, 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 and become egoistic and be standing and trampling everyone down, but just because they were to fulfill the purpose of glorifying God so that the entire world would come to glorify God. That's what was special about them, not anything inherent in them. Great, great point, Pastor, and, and thank you for that. But that, um, Pastor Richardson, it, just to follow up a little more on this, we, it, we, we learned from the lesson, as and, and Pastor made it clear, Israel possessed no special personal qualities which would warrant such a choice. The, 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 the text in, in Deuteronomy, Moses says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord. So what is preventing them from continuing to be holy when they are called? And so that's a great question, uh, Elder Webb. We get in our own way. God chose Israel to be custodians of the word, not owners. They took it as they owned it and tried to keep it to themselves, but God gave them custody because God deals in relationships. Yes. Even if you think about is, um, a, Abraham's seed, what does Abraham represent? And so Abraham represents blind faith in God. His relationship is so strong that God chose to make a covenant with him that I will be your God and your people will be my people. And so God chose the people to be custodians of the world to share this valuable message that the world needs to hear not keep it yourself now because of sin we get in god's way and we get in our own way and sin allowed them to go the scripture says that sin has allowed us to go our own way everyone has turned to their own way and because we're not focused on god grounded in god understanding the right relationship we're likely to break even the covenant because once you don't keep the terms of a covenant which is binding you have broken that covenant and so Israel will often break the covenant. Thank God that God is a God who would want always strive with his people. And because of his love and compassion, he, God, through the person of Christ and through Christ's compassion and forgiveness, refused to give up on Israel and all peoples. And so hope and salvation is always available to those who are willing to accept. Mm, yeah. Ella Watson, Dr. Murray, let me hear. Ella Watson, then I take you, Dr. Murray. Yes, Ella Watson. You know, I, I, you know, we live in a culture, an Ella Webb, that I thought, you know, when we talk about God chose somebody, we, we right away think that he rejected others. We need to understand that God's choosing is not his rejection of others. God choosing Israel was not that he was rejecting the other nations, right? 
God, 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 God chose them for a purpose to evangelize. They were known to be instrument in God's hand. So, you know, you are chosen to do a job doesn't mean that God rejected me. It just means that, that with that, with that with that choosing come great responsibilities. And I think that's something that we need to learn as Christians. The, the elevation of one is not the the what you call the um deterioration no, of the other. <laughs> and so we, we can't we cannot confuse that. But God choosing Israel wasn't putting them on a pedestal to say that they were better and higher. You know, we talk about, you know, you know, Abraham see that we are the head and not the tail. You know, the head in what sense? <laughs> not, not to take advantage of others. That's, that's not the purpose. Here God was saying, you know, what it is, you are my personal possession. I love you. And the Bible says it's a mystery because it was nothing in us. Grace is a mystery, not something that they earn or deserve. But divine grace was merited to them, just like how it's given to us. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Murray. <laughs> yes. So through this chosen nation, you know, God purposed to bring a blessing to all mankind. And uh, I just want to go back to the clock story, which I love. <laughs> that clock stopping affected so many people. And there was no one who said, hey, isn't something off here? Isn't something wrong? But even if there was someone who said that, it wouldn't have worked for me. I would have chosen to be late for school or whatever because the clock stopped, right? People choose what they want to do. And sometimes they hear what is correct, what is right, what to think about. They're going to choose the easiest path, the most convenient path. And God chose this nation to keep that clock going, to remind, to tell people. And uh, the clock stops and people get off track. It's a beautiful little story. You, you, you know, um, Elder Webb, um, and to our viewers, between 1 Peter 2 and Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, where it highlights the, the, the value and the qualities of this people chosen by God, there is something we must recognize. To be chosen, set apart for God, that's what makes you holy. Mm -hmm. So let's get it now. It is God's choosing of you and setting you apart that makes that action a holy action. You are set apart for the use of God. That's what sacred means, to be set apart. However, you can decide once you're set apart that you're not going to follow God. So you don't be, remain holy and sacred anymore, even Though God has set you apart and made you a sacred and holy per, per people. So we need to understand that the holiness of this chosen nation has nothing inherent in them. It's in the calling of God. And, 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 and the second thing we must recognize is that the, 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 the verses describe a future accomplishment or state of which the people should be in. For he says in Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6, you have been chosen to be a special people and above all people. You are to be. That means they were not yet. And even as Peter describes it, he shows that they are called for a reason and for a purpose. And, 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 and we want people to get that because even though God has blessed the Jews and Israel, even until today, the blessings of God are still trickling down on that nation. There is nothing inherent in any nation that makes them special above any other nation. A people special when they cooperate and fulfill the calling to be holy. Pastor Dowdin. Hold on, Dalbert. I want to ask Pastor Dowdin a question. Is that calling for the church today? Well, the church means called out. Okay. That's what the word church means. You are okay. called out of. Okay. So just like Israel is called out of the world right. to be a light to the dark world, the church is called by Christ 
to be the light to the dark world. We are in the same position. We have a purpose to be separated in holiness and fulfill our purpose. Not putting down others as Elder Watson says, but loving and respecting others and bringing the light of the gospel to them. Thank you. All right, Dal Dalbert, let me hear, because I want to make a point again, Pastor, but Dalbert, let me hear what you have to say. Yeah, I, I was just thinking, as based on what Pastor was saying, that yes. the calling doesn't equal salvation. Thank you. Let's <laughs> understand that. <laughs> the calling doesn't equal salvation. Not because your call means that you're saved. Right? So we are called, but there, there, there is a responsibility to that calling. And, and, and so we can be called, but doesn't because the Jews as a nation were called. Are they all saved? So calling doesn't equal salvation, and we need to understand that. We need all to right. work out our salvation, the Bible says, right? <laughs> but, but also, we need to see it also, Elder Watson. Um, Peter, make it clear in the memory verse. That when you, because you are you 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 are, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, you have a job to do now. Yeah. That is, you must just show forth the praise of Him, and I. It, it is clear as day. If you don't do it, there's going to be a consequence. Are you with me on that, Pastor Dowden? Indeed. All right. Indeed. Okay. So, Pastor Dowden, I'm going to come to you and ask you to tell us, tell the church, because we are studying about Abraham's seed. And there was some deal that was struck here, I mean, some land deal. I'm going to come to you on that. But while we're on that, I want our viewers to understand, too, that as a, as a church, we have the same responsibility. And Elder Alvaranga make it clear in the chat, just like the clock, if you stop from working, it throws off everybody. And I think Elder Watson had made no, um, uh, mentioned that earlier. This, this, it's the same thing with the church. Now, what, 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 the point that Elder Alvaranga is making, if we stop functioning as a church, will the people even notice that? That would be a big problem. That's a problem. But we're going to stop there for now since we are out of time and we have a sharp program this morning. Pastor, this land deal, a deal that comes with obligation, Genesis 32, ver 35, verse 13. The earthly promised land was to the Jews, Pastor. We remember that clearly studying over the last couple of weeks. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promised land of heaven and the earth made new is for us. So all these people were still living by faith, Pastor. When they died, they did not receive these things promised, but they saw them afar off and they welcomed them from a distance. What's our deal? And what's the deal with us today? <laughs> it's, 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 it's a nice coined um, phrase uh, to, for this lesson, land deal. <laughs> you know, uh, many people would prefer a money deal or some kind of other deal, but this is a land deal. And, and it fulfills the purpose of God. God would give you what you need, but somewhere also to settle so that you would have stability and be established. And God wanted his people to be established across the earth. But this land deal is a promise that God is fulfilling. God is fulfilling this promise to Abraham. And he continued to fulfill the promise all through the generations after Abraham. And when Moses came and brought the people out of Israel, out of Egypt, then they begin to see that the promise is coming to fulfillment as they get nearer and nearer to Canaan. I am, I am saying to us today that even in our lives, in, in, in modern times, God has promised a new earth. Because Abraham's seed was to replenish the earth with the glory of God. We are Abraham's seed because of Christ. And Christ has promised to give every nation, every tongue, every people who accepts him by faith a new earth. And they will also reap the benefit of Abraham for his descendants were to fulfill and populate the entire earth. Thank you. So, Dr. Murray and Pastor Richardson, let me talk, start with Dr. Murray first. What if somebody should ask us, after 400 years, this promise was made from the and 400 years later? I, I love what uh, Joseph reminded the people of to remember God's promise and to carry his bones to the promised land. 
I, I think that was a, a great way for it to instill in their minds that there is hope that the time will come when they will leave and uh, they knew they would be there for a hundred years. I mean, it was all laid out. And so Joseph reminded them, uh, Joseph would be got, forgotten by the Pharaohs, but they would, he would be remembered by the, the people of Israel and they would carry his bones back to the promised land. Amen. Um, Pastor Richardson. And so what's important in this topic is that God always keeps his promises. It doesn't matter the time. Time is but like a day in the sight of God. And so even though because of sin and disobedience, or all of the uh, adults would die out, but God still kept the promise to the offspring. And so with the exception of the two leaders, uh, Aaron and Joshua, the offspring inherited the promise. Because God is faithful, and he will always mm -hmm. keep his part of the bargain. And so of the covenant, God was uh, faithful to carry it out, and so the children would inherit the land. And so the land is a promise of God that God kept. Amen. Delbert, I don't want to move on unless I give you a chance to talk about land, because I know you're a man who loves your landowners. Yeah, mm -hmm. owner, and you. you, you, you. <laughs> one, of, one of the beauty about this story, um, Ella, the, 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 the promised land comes with condition. The covenant come with conditions. And the conditions are, you know, these are the potentials. You see, I see the blessings as potentials of Israel. If you do this thing, these are the potential that you, this is how it's going to happen. And if not, there are consequences. You know, like Pastor Men mentioned, we are also candidates for an eternal land. But there are conditions for us to inherit that kind of eternal land. And the Bible said, if we obey, right? If we listen, because the truth is obedience is really our willingness to listen. And if we listen, we will inherit the land. If we don't listen, then we will reap the consequences, you know? Uh, Ella Watson, uh, this pushes us into Israel and the covenant. Listen to what the text says. But they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubbornness of their evil heart. So the Bible says, so I brought on them all the curses of the covenant I had commanded them to follow, but they did not keep. Pastor Dowden, wasn't the covenant relationship a commitment, one as serious and sacred as that of marriage? You know, Elder, um, God in his behavior shows how serious he takes his covenants. From Genesis chapter 15 and verse 13, he already told Abraham that his people, his descendants, his seed would go into slavery for 400 years, but he would bring them out. And as Pastor Richardson is saying, no matter how much time it takes, God will fulfill his covenant. And now he has a covenant that he has given to the entire world through Abraham and through Christ. Now the, 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 the center and the ax of this covenant is Christ because of faith in Christ, as, 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 as Galatians tells us and as Romans tells us, that it is because of faith in Christ that we will have access to the promise given to Abraham. And the inheritance is to inherit the new earth, not just Canaan or Israel or Palestine, but the entire world will be ours when it's made new. And God will take the time necessary as he has promised to prepare that. But we have an example in what he did for the children of Israel that he will fulfill his promise. Amen. Dr. Murray, I know you want to say something on that, but just for the benefit of our viewers, we, you, at this time, we usually would take a break, but we're going to forego the break this morning because we are going to be ending at 10 minutes to just to, uh, you know, pay a little tribute to our mothers. So we want you to stay with us and continue um, listening and, you know, invite others to join as we um, study God's word. We're discussing this morning, Abraham's seed. We have studying with us, Elder Dalbert Watson, um, Dr. Jenny Buckhart Murray, our own church pastor, um, Dr. Sean Dowding, and Pastor Ivor Richardson.
talking about Abraham's seed. So, Dr. Murray, let's go back again and talk about this covenant um, with Israel. Yes, the the covenant covenant as um, we based studied, on the text that we read earlier. Yes, the covenant we that we've been studying throughout. We know that God, He didn't need to do anything for His people, but He did it out of love for us, and. There were conditions, um, but it is a covenant that requires a relationship. It's not just some agreement that is signed and you go on your merry way and it gets tucked into a drawer and people forget about it. This is a relationship it, and it's based on um, just the principles and values of a meaningful relationship of commitment. And uh, it does talk about marriage and how serious that commitment is. And this is the same thing. God is a God of relationships. He wants our hearts. He wants our commitment. And he gives us so much more than we can ever give him. That's the covenant. And it was broken. All right. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Before I go to Dalbert, Pastor Richardson. And so I want to emphasize that God deeds out of love and compassion, that God holds us in the palm of his hand. He holds us fast, according to the psalmist, meaning we can't slip or fail. But also we need to recognize that God brings discipline. Most Christians don't want to hear that. They would immerse in God's love and would soak that up and accept that God is a God of love. But when we break the covenant, there is retribution. And the psalmist says that God is just when he pronounces his judgment because we deserve them. Yet he doesn't give up on us. There's always another opportunity to repent, be remorse for your sin, clean yourself up with God's help and God's blood, and you can be made back into right relationship. So God is looking out for us and has our best interests at heart all the time. And thank you. Ella Watson. Yeah. Uh, Ella Webb, as we look through the chronicle of history, we see the progression of sin. I think the lesson is pointing out here that sin progresses, it gets worse. Without divine help, without divine intervention, Israel of old was destined for failure. Without divine help today, you and I are this, this destined for failure. Sin will run its natural course and it leads to death. So we saw here, even though we, we like to say that it was God who was punishing Israel, I beg to differ. It was the natural consequences of sin. Sin left unchecked leads to death. So it's not God was, was punishing them. They, 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 when Adam and Eve sinned, the consequences was what? That if God did not intervene, that would have been the result there and then. Uh, but Ella Watson, Pastor, Dr. Murray, I know you want to say something, but Ella Watson, isn't it, the, is, is God speaking here? He says, so I brought on them all the curses of the covenant. So it tells me that they knew that there was going to be a curse if they didn't follow. If they Absolutely. didn't listen. So is it, is it God? God said, I'm going to put you in, 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 slave, in slavery. Was God doing it? No. It was Nebuchadnezzar who came. Sometimes God said, I will. I'm taking on the responsibility. But when you look at the story, was it really with God? And so when God said, I will, God already in the covenant said, if you obey, these are the benefits. If you don't, these are the consequences. Is it God doing it? Or is it our decisions that are leading to these inevitable consequences of disobedience? Mm. Because remember, Jesus said, I don't come to kill anybody. Mm. <laughs> in John 10, 10, he said, the enemy comes to kill and to destroy. Understand. So all of a sudden, no, we are saying God is killing. No, God said, I have come to give you life and abundant life. But when we refuse life, the inevitable result is death. Ah, so Dr. Murray, what Ella Watson is saying, there is benefit and there is consequences in our actions. Yes, yes, yes. Um, poor we. Uh, <laughs> we. We just can't seem to get it straight. We're no different. Um the, the verse in Jeremiah eleven eight says they didn't even listen. They didn't incline their ear. They walked according to their own imagination. That, that tells me that we have to be so vigilant. You know, we look and we say, well, what was wrong with them? Why didn't they understand all that God had given them? But it's true today. We're not inclined to listen to what God has promised us or instructed us to do. We're not inclined because... There are so many things that attract us, 
that, you know, benefit us. And we have to be vigilant and otherwise we, we fall off. It, it, it just takes a little while. We saw it in the beginning. We saw it after the flood. We saw it, you know, when the Israelites came out of Egypt. It doesn't take long at all for people to get off track and, and listen to what they want to hear rather than to listen to God and what he has promised. And, 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 as, and as dangerous as that is, Dr. Murray Elowebb, as dangerous and, 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 and devastating that can be, one could lose their eternal salvation yes. by going to the other side. Yes. Christ still comes after you. And even yeah. if you break the covenant, Christ is coming after you. Christ will take you back. Now, that, ha that is more than faithfulness. That is more than his share of the covenant and, his and of the bargain. You know, a covenant has no value if it's broken. Mm -hmm. But yet still Christ says, I keep the value of this covenant and I hold it before you. I'm coming after you. I'm calling you back to me. And that's why Jeremiah in chapter three describes it as a, a, a wife going, being divorced and sent away and goes and marries someone else. And then the law of, 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 the, of the Hebrews says, you don't go back to the first husband. But Jesus is saying, I'm taking you back. Now, friends, let me, I, I don't know how more can God present to us his willingness, his compassion, his mercy, and his forgiveness of our sins, and his readiness to take us back. Amen. So, Pastor Richardson, what I hear Pastor Dowden saying is that God is more willing to give you the what he promised than to execute judgment. And that's absolutely correct. We know that uh, the spirit is willing in us, but our bodies are weak. And so, as uh, Elder Watson alluded, uh, we are inclined to turn to our own way and break God's promise or covenant. And it's our own doing that leads us to those negative consequences or punishment, so to speak, or judgment, so to speak. God always holds out hope, an opportunity to be repentant, to redeem yourself, and to re-enter the covenant anew. He never gives up on us. And that's the beautiful thing about the holy and righteous God we serve. Amen. And I like the way when Dr. Murray read the verse. She sounds so sympathetic with the people. It does remind me of how God himself must have felt when he had to do what he did. But, you know, God loves us so much. And as Pastor Dowden says, he's a merciful God. He wants to give us mercy and love. Not no, uh, Ella Webb, I just want to stick a pin here. Um, yes, I sir. think we need to think about really how God operates with us. Hmm. Because sometimes we think that because God knows the end to the beginning, he's a manipulator. And he manipulates people. But the antediluvian world, which is the world before the flood, tells us that he doesn't manipulate people. Do you think God in his love and his mercy would sit back and say, okay, because I know that they're not, they're not gonna follow me, I'll just watch them until it's time for me to destroy them? God spent time and time again seeking to win back his people, working on their hearts to make sure he could save the one that was willing to be saved. And, and, and this goes to show that God in his foreknowledge does not manipulate people. He works with the hearts of people so they can choose to serve him. And he gives them all the chance to do so. But in the end, when he recognizes that the time has come, when you have made your final decision, not to follow him, then he will act. But in that time before, he's a God who is seeking the heart of the lost, seeking to give his love to humankind. Amen. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And we saw it with Israel over and over again. God, you know, we can connect the dots, connect the stories. And I think even in our own lives, we can connect, connect the dots. We can look back to say, you know, God was talking to me then, but I didn't hear him, That's you know, but he brought me to this place where I had to make, I felt compelled to make a decision for once and for all. 
and um, you make your decision. And just thinking about one of the most horrible stories is King Agrippa. He came to that point and he said no. Yeah. How sad is that? Beautiful, Dr. Murray. Thank you. Elder Watson, the remnant. Despite Israel's re repeated cycle of apostasy, divine judgment and repentance, there is always hope. According to Isaiah 4, verse 3, said, Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy. Uh, another verse in Micah says, The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. Tell us a little about that remnant, please. <laughs> uh, um, you know, even though Israel failed as a nation, mm. God always have a people, or a group of people, or even individuals within that nation that he is willing to work with. You know, the word remnant really comes out of an experience that something bad is going to happen, but, but we're going to have some survivors. That's what the remnant really, really means. Something bad is going to happen, maybe a catastrophe, but some people are going to be saved. And what we're saying here, Israel as a nation has failed, but in that group, there are some people there are, some, there are some people, and sometimes they're not so much visible, and that's why we have to be careful. <laughs> because Elijah reminds us that sometimes we think we are the only one, and sometimes these, these remnants are not so um, visible, but God always have a people. For, for, for in, the no, um, in, the, in the flood time, Noah was that person. You know, so the remnant is that God always have a people or a group of people that he is willing to work with or who are willing to work with God yes, so Ella. that his mission <laughs> can be accomplished. Yes, I like that part, Ella. Willing That's to work with I would make people who are willing to work with him. Yes. And, and on top of that, they are no different from anyone else except that they have chosen to follow God. They're having the same problems in life, the same, right. whatever, but they have made a decision in their life. And, and uh, that's a beautiful thing. Thank you, Dr. Morris. So it's, that is same thing with when he comes down to God choosing Abraham, God choosing Noah, you know, what I mean, it's because of obedience, they believe, you know, and it's accounted to them for righteousness. Um, Dr. Um, Pastor Richardson, let me just tie in Thursday and Friday together. Spiritual Israel. We, when we talk about spiritual Israel, we are saying the promise made to Abraham are to be fulfilled through Christ. Because the lesson was quick to remind us that all men are of one family by creation, which is God, and are all one through redemption, which is Jesus. Tell us, Sabbath School, what we make from that. And so we must recognize that when we accept Christ, we become part of a large family, not your blood family, but your mm -hmm. spiritual family, Christ being the head or cornerstone. And so that relates to remnant also, because the remnant represents what's left of the true value. Let's say you take fabric or tapestry. The remnant, although sometimes you can't do much with it because there's so little that's left, it has a true value. And so those who have remained faithful to God, those who have served and those who have allowed God's spirit to condition them and to cover them with Jesus' blood, which he died for the penalty of their sin, uh, represents a remnant. Scripture tells us God is looking for people or remnant without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. And that remnant is called, God says, be perfect as I am perfect. That's a tall order. When you think of the fact that we are sin oriented and we're distracted by sin and the our enemy, the deceiver with his slickness and his deception is trying to deceive us and get us off our mark. But God in his faithfulness, think of Abraham. Uh, God chose Abraham for a relationship because Abraham was representing the true remnant. He was faithful to God. Abraham represented blind trust in God so much so that he's willing to slay his own son in sacrifice. And God rewards that. You know, faith is a difficult thing because faith causes us uh, to believe some things uh, that are not so believable. And I say that because if you look at what Paul tells the Hebrews, he says, no, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so sometimes there's no physical evidence for faith. But thank God we, those who accept Christ, know that Christ drops spiritual evidence in our thinking. And so we know 
that faith exists and faith is valuable. And so as a remnant uh, to be in right relationship with God, because God rewards right relationship, we have to give our all to Christ. My God, thank you so much, Pastor Richards. I really, really love that. So beautifully said. Um, Pastor Dowding, I know you're anxious to make a point. Go ahead and make that point, then I come back um, to number one. It, it was very interesting listening to Pastor Richardson. Yes, that yes. So yes. True. And that is what the world has and uses as an excuse not to come to God because faith is something so simple yet complex. And the definition of faith makes it almost unbelievable. It's illogical. Intellectuals find a hard time accepting faith because faith is something you believe in that doesn't exist, that doesn't, it, it's not tangible before you, it is not there, you don't have it, you don't see it, and you believe it. You believe it's there, you believe that you have it, you believe it's yours. But that faith, that concept of faith, has to be coupled with something that Christ does in the heart of every human being. Paul says to every man, God has given a measure of faith. Therefore, God puts something inside of man that when man comes into a relationship with him, that is activated and opens the door so that his faith can be activated. Man has to be in some kind of relationship with God so that he can understand the experience of believing in something that is not there, of holding on to something that you cannot touch because of God working in your heart. Amen. Amen. So beautifully said. Pastor, um, just for our viewers, who could have told that Abraham's seed, lesson number six, would have been so interesting. We have to wrap up now, and I'm going to give you all guys a chance just to say one, to make one short, one very short comment. Dr. Murray, I'm going to start with you. It's Mother's Day. We're not going to put too much pressure on you <laughs> during this Mother's Day season. Make a short point. Doc, um, Pastor Richardson, come right after Dr. Murray, Elder Watson, and then Pastor I will have you say the amen. Um, let's try to make this as short as possible. Thanks. So 30 seconds. Uh, what is wonderful is that God called out this remnant people. He made a line of people because he saw from beginning from end and that remnant has carried the knowledge of God through centuries and we need to continue to um, glorify God and to serve the purpose of allowing people to understand who God is. Amen. Amen. Pastor Richardson. And so I like what Paul tells the Romans in Romans 5, 8. He said, but God commanded his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so God didn't wait for us to know who he was or that we need to accept him. He went and made provision by dying on a cross, shedding his blood. And because of that plan of salvation, all of the remnant church, because it's only to those who would accept Christ and serve him, have an opportunity to inherit this plan and to receive eternal life. What a beautiful legacy and promise that Christ offers us. Amen. Ella Watson, you have less than 30 seconds, it seems. Okay. Uh, one thing I would say, um, the promise that God made to Abraham, was only fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And through him, all the nation, Jews, Gentiles, and whatever nationality, creed, and religion, all nation will be blessed. And that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. And because of that, we can have hope in the promise of Jesus Christ, his soon coming, that we will inherit that land, Elder Webb. Not the land of Canaan down in um, Israel, but the heavenly Canaan because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Pastor, final amen. And I would say to close that righteousness can only come when you believe in Jesus. No one can be righteous without believing in Christ. And believing in Christ is to believe in his word, the lifestyle he lived, appropriated for ourselves, not trying to do it our, on our own, 
not trying to build doctrines on our own, but believing and understanding the word of Christ, and then following and obeying that, that is what makes us righteous, nothing else. And Amen. then we are hearers of the promise. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, panelists. We are going to um, transition now to make a tribute to our mothers. Um, then we will come back and we'll close off. Um, uh, so we're going to um, share with you right now a, a tribute from a, a, a one of our children of the church and a beautiful song. Um, this song has blessed me the first time I heard it, and I pray that it will bless your heart too. Pleasant Sabbath morning to all our virtual viewers and happy Sabbath to our mothers. This weekend is very special weekend. We are celebrating you. Please know that we love you. You all are M magnificent. Oh, optimistic. T, teacher. H, healing hands. E, extraordinary person. R, right. Mothers, you are always right. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Have a spectacular Sabbath and happy Mother's Day. With love. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, especially my mother, Olive Jackson. From all of us, we love you. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for all that you've done for the family that you continue to do. And we hope you enjoy this day to the fullest. Know that we are always here for you. And just as God's love never fails, our love for you never fails. i 
This time we'll hear from our men's ministry director, um, Pastor Ivor Richards. Thank you, Elder Webb. Uh, we want to, at this time, uh, recognize our mothers. You can go ahead, Ella. Okay, something is going on here. Okay. Can you see me? No, I can't. There's something on here. The host has asked you to stop the video. Uh, let's turn your video on. Okay. All right. There right. it is. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, we wanted this time to uh, recognize our mothers on behalf of Pastor Dowling, the elders, and the entire leadership at First White Plains. And in particular, on behalf of the men's ministry, we want to pay tribute to our mothers with a brief poem and a very brief prayer. And so we've chosen a poem called Wonderful Mother. It goes as follows. God made a wonderful mother, a mother who never grows old. He made her smile of the sunshine and he molded her heart of pure gold. In her eyes, he placed bright shining stars. In her cheeks, fair roses you see. God made a wonderful mother and he gave that dear mother to me. While we honor all our mothers with words of love and praise, while we tell about their goodness and their kind and loving ways, we should also think of grandma. She's a mother too, you see, for she mothered my dear mother as my mother mothers me. Let us pray. God, we thank you for all our mothers, not only those who are mothers by birth, but those who are mothers by adoption and those who are mothers by nurturing children. Bless our mothers in a special way because we recognize their tremendous uh, gift to humanity, Lord, in the way they nurture us from the time we're born until sometimes the time we die. And so mothers always show love and compassion as you did, dear Lord. And because of their love and care, Lord, the world is a better place. Because of their love and care, many sons and daughters has grown into well-balanced individuals. And so we're much indebted to our mothers. So on this Mother's Day, we pray you may bless our mothers. You may anoint them from on high. You may pour out your spirit in them that they may not grow weary in well-doing. They'll continue to do the good work of making us better people. Bless them, anoint them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh... Pastor Richardson, we want to thank Janelle Bernard and Kevin Jackson. 
and Audrey for putting this together for us, for our mothers. We are so grateful. We have come to the end of our Sabbath School study this morning. We thank everyone who have come uh, to watch us from wherever you are. Um, this morning we had with us Elder Dalbert Watson, Pastor Ivor Richardson, Dr. Jane Bucat Murray, and our own church pastor, Sean Dowding. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much for watching us. Remember, folks, that we are not spiritually perfect individuals, but God consider us to be holy for the purpose of salvation. Remember, if you are Christ, then you are indeed Abraham's seed. We look forward to seeing you next week. Stay with us. Divine service begins right now. God bless. Atlantic Union Youth Ministries Office presents 2021 Virtual Pathfinder Camporee, May 14th to May 16th. Pathfinders, come and explore the story of Ruth under the theme, Determined. Know, love, serve Jesus. You can't afford to miss it. The story of Ruth dramatized. Fun activities, team challenges, numerous honors, including new honors, such as the Ruth Honor, Atlantic Union Honor, and Compassion Honor. Be the first to complete and receive them. Worship experience with dynamic preaching from pastors David Chandler, Andres Peralta, Elias Zavala, Bill Wood, and Armando Miranda. Registration is free at www.auyouth.com. Register today to enjoy the benefits of joining the numerous breakout room activities. Join the thousands who will be viewing this virtual camporee live on the online platforms. These are Facebook Live, Atlantic Union Adventist Youth Ministries, or YouTube, AU Youth Media. May 14th, 7 p.m. to May 16th, 1 p.m. See you at the camporee. Good morning and happy Sabbath one and all. I'd like to welcome you back to First White Plains Online. For those of you who joined in with us this morning for the 8 a.m. prayer service, as well as the 10 a.m. Sabbath classes, I'm sure you were blessed. Please continue to invite your friends and family out to join in with us in worship. And as we move closer to our divine service hour, I'd just like to say a happy acknowledgement for those of you who are joining us for the first time online. Please do not let this be your last time joining in with us. We are so happy to have you here. Now for our featured announcement. Well, tonight is the night. We've been talking about this event for a few weeks now. Tonight is our family, First White Plains Friends Family Drive-In Movie Night. We're asking that you come out, that you support. It's starting at 8 p.m., but you can arrive as early as 7.30. And I don't know about you, but I have my popcorn and gummy bears ready for tonight. So for those of you who are hearing about this for the first time, feel free to reach out to our Family Life Department where you can receive more information. And for those of you who are ready, I will see you there on the church grounds in the parking lot at 7.30. Now on to this week's birthday celebrations. On May 10th, we have Georgia Anderson celebrating her birthday. On May 12th, we have Heather Daniel and Amber Perry celebrating their birthday. On May 13th, we have Kirk Jackson celebrating his birthday. And on May 14th, we have Michelle Davis Brown as well as Avery Ann Larman. With our anniversaries coming up this week, 
we have on May 13th, Margaret and Larry Benson. Happy birthday and happy anniversary to our couple. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. Happy Sabbath, church, and a very special happy Sabbath to all of our viewers and visiting friends. Welcome back to our online worship experience. On behalf of Pastor and Sister Dowding, as well as their pastoral team, I say welcome. We are pleased to know that you have chosen to worship with us today. We're also happy that we are able to contribute to your spiritual needs and are looking forward to the day when we can fellowship together again in person. May God continue to bless you all. Blessed Sabbath, everyone, as we celebrate with all mothers. And so for our call to worship, we are encouraged by a mother, and not just any mother, but the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And so in the book of Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 46, Mary says, My soul does magnify the Lord. Will you magnify his name with me? And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for he that is mighty, I want to remind you, you serve a mighty God, has done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and has exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he sent empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever and ever. I want to tell you, we are a part of his seed and God will be with us forever and forever. Friends, this is or call to worship. Be blessed. today. I want God to make me have his way with me. Do whatever you like with me, Jesus. I want him to have his way with me. Come on. Do you want God to have his way with you?
Gracious, loving Father in heaven, we come before you to give you praise, to give you glory, to give you honor for who you are. We praise you, Lord, because you are our God. We praise you because you are our creator, and we praise you because you are our savior. We thank you, O oh Lord, for all that you have done for us. We thank you, O oh Lord, for saving our lives. We thank you, O oh Lord, for, for protecting us and keeping us safe this week. Lord, we thank you that you are constantly by our side, watching over us, guiding us and taking care of us. We thank you for all that you have provided for us, for our food, our shelter, for our homes, for the opportunity to work, for the opportunity to live. We thank you, O oh God. And yet, Lord, we recognize that we do not deserve all that you have given to us and done for us. We do not deserve your love. But we recognize that because of your deep, deep love for us, that you have called us, you have called us to come boldly before your throne of grace. And here we are, Lord, and we ask you to forgive us. Forgive us for our weaknesses and our failings. Please, Lord, have mercy upon us and forgive us for our sins. We ask, O oh God, that you would meet the needs of your people, for there is so much pain and hardship and suffering in this world. Lord, we ask that you will draw near to each one, that you will bring comfort to those who are mourning, those who are, who are grieving, that they may experience you in a very special way. We ask, O oh God, that you will bring peace to those who are troubled and worried. We ask, Lord, that you would be a friend, a companion to those who feel lonely. And we ask that you would be a healer to those who are ill and beset with pain, beset with 
disease. Oh God, we pray that you would be close to all of us, for we need you. We ask, oh Father, that you would remember those who are elderly, our senior citizens, who have given so much of their lives to you and your work. Oh Lord, we pray that you will be near to them now. Help them to know that you are always with them, that they are never alone. Lord, we ask that you will be with those who are unable to go out, whether for health reasons or for whatever reason, that you would be near to them, Lord. We ask that you would be with each of the members of our church, be, be with each of our um, viewers online, all those who are visiting. We ask, Lord, that you would be with each member of our families, whether here or abroad, that your spirit may abide with us, that your spirit may come close to us. Father God, we ask that you will continue to bless us and to keep us. We ask, O oh Lord, especially that you would be with our worship this morning, that you would be with our fellowship, that this, it would be acceptable in your sight. And please, O oh Father, remember the speaker of the hour. Lord, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to come into his heart, that you would touch his lips that every word he speaks may be coming from directly from your throne. And that we, as we hear and as we listen, that we would be changed and leave this worship service different, better and equipped to serve you. And so God, we thank you so much for hearing our prayer today. We thank you for this opportunity to be together today to worship you. So continue to bless us and may we enjoy a wonderful Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen. We are nothing without the Lord. He's our strength. He's our keeper. He's amazing. Come on, speak to him. Say, God, I love you. God, I honor you. God, you're amazing. Come on. You are my strength. Strength. 
worship God. We worship God in our giving. We return 10% of our income. We give faithfully and joyfully back to God. Our offerings pour from our hearts of gratitude and love to our Lord and Savior. We have four ways of giving. You may use the Adventist giving application. You may use the Zelle application in your bank account. You may write a check to the first SDA church of White Plains and mail it in to the address on the screen. And finally, you may make arrangements to pick up or drop off your cash. Contact our treasury staff. Your local church benefits from all the offerings you give. We are grateful to you for your support. Thanks for choosing our ways of giving. May God bless you always. I invite you to take a pause, bow your heads as we pray to God and give thanks for his many blessings and the giving of our tithes and offerings. Lord, our God and creator, we joyfully present to you our tithes and offerings. We know you own the cattle on a thousand hills and the earth, O God, is yours in all its fullness. 
We know that everything is at your disposal and you are not dependent on us. Nevertheless, God, please accept this humble offering, these tithes which are yours, that we give back to you with great delight. It is our desire, O God, to honor you out of the increase that we have and to show that you are the God of our lives and of our hearts. O God, bless these offerings and these tithes. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. boys and girls, and welcome back to another week of story time. I pray that you all had a fantastic week. Before we start the story, let us recite the memory verse for the week. And yes, we will recite it together. Ready? One, two, three. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. And where can we find this memory verse? Yes, Psalm 138, verse 1. Terrific. Now for the story. Two girls were playing on the floor as their mother entertained some guests. Everyone was at the dinner table ready to start eating. Mom said to the girls, please come to the table. We're ready to eat but the girls paid no attention to her, not even when she said it two more times. One of the dinner guests was the girl's Sabbath school teacher. She asked the girls, I wonder which one of you can finish this Bible verse. Children obey, both girls quickly answered. Children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, Ephesians 6 verse one. The verse told the girls to obey their mother, but they still didn't obey. What was wrong? The girls were hearers of the word of God, but not doers. They knew the words, but they didn't do what the word said. Knowing the words didn't help the girls, did it? They needed to do what they had learned. Boys and girls, God wants us to put into practice the words of the Bible. The words won't change us and help us until we do what they say. The Apostle James writes, be doers of the word and not hearers only. The first thing God wants us to do is to believe in Jesus. And when we believe in Jesus, we also want to obey him. Okay, boys and girls. Let us bow our heads and close our eyes for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Lord, help us to be hearers and doers of your word. Amen. Thank you for listening, boys and girls. I pray that you have a beautiful rest of the Sabbath day. The scripture reading today is taken from 2 Kings chapter 6, and I will be reading from verses 1 through to 7. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, where each of us can get a pole, and let us build a place there for us to meet. And he said, Go. Then one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron ax head fell into the water. Oh no, my Lord, he cried out, it was borrowed. The man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there. 
and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. This is the word of the Lord. sisters we want to give god thanks for another beautiful day of worship we give god thanks for songs of praise that draw our hearts to him and i pray that as you watch and as you listen and as you participate in your hearts and with your voices and reach out to god that you will in return receive answers to your questions you will receive a blessing by the touch of the divine hand i want to welcome you to this moment which is called the breaking of the word this is our online experience here at fwp center the first seventh day adventist church of white plains i invite you to bow your heads as we take time now to open the word of god father in heaven as we come now to open your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit will attend every heart and speak to us that only you can do and reach our hearts with the truth of your love. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank our friend for reading the scripture reading this morning, which was taken from 2 Kings chapter 6 verses one to six and this text this morning is like a lever it will be springing us over into a certain topic 
under magical or divine power. God's people with magical and divine power. So let's take a dive into the text. In this scripture, we find the sons of the prophets, meaning those who go to school to learn how to be prophets. In verse 6, they wanted to build a new place, which was a bigger place for their dwelling, where they would be taught and they would learn. And so they wanted a little bit more space. They went down to the Jordan and they started cutting wood. Elijah says, go ahead. And they asked him to come with him. And as this young man was cutting wood and trees, his ax fell off and fell into the water. And he cried out to the prophet as if spontaneously. This was borrowed. You know, what am I going to do? And so here we have in verse um, five, but as one was down cutting down a tree, the axe, the iron axe fell into the water and he cried out and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God says, where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there. And he made the iron float. The axe floated. Therefore, he said, pick it up yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. Now, this is very interesting because this very story shows the participation of the young man. It shows that even Elijah himself didn't know where it fell. It's not, th th he had to ask the question, where did it fall? And this is going to teach us quite a bit about what some consider that what Elisha did was not a miracle. They consider it as the power of magic, magical art, taking a stick, throwing it in the water, and the axe floats. And therefore, that's not a miracle. That's a, that's a magical art. So the question I say to you today, my friends, you know, modern science and magical heart, arts have questioned the authenticity of the miracles of God throughout Scripture. What is worse is that even some Christians have also questioned the validity of the miracles of God, which are found in the Bible. In 2 Kings Chapter 6, our scripture reading. Some say this was just magical power used by Elijah to float the axe to the surface of the Jordan River. Some even believe that since the practice of witchcraft was very present among the people of Egypt and Babylon, the Israelites had adopted this practice as well. It is also believed that it was not uncommon for religious people, including priests, to practice magical arts. So they feel that priests and prophets and God's people practiced magical arts. Today, my friends, my viewers, a challenging question for you is, what does the Bible teach about magic and magicians? Did God's people practice magical arts? And the next big question is, does God approve of some magical arts? What does it say about miracles, the Bible? What does the Bible say? What is the difference between miracles and magic? Who is behind miracles and who is behind magical arts? And one question for us personally is, am I involved in magical arts without knowing or wanting to. So my friends, let's first define the words magic and magicians. The magic is the secret art of the magician. It's the magician is also called a sorcerer, enchanter, wizard, or a witch. In the practice of magic, rites and formulas are used by means of calling supernatural forces that they believe will come to make themselves available to those who are performing the magic. And it's for the benefit of doing something that is good or something that is bad 
to someone or to something. That's the, the sense of the word magic. It's calling up some supernatural power using rit rites and formulas to bring benefit to the one who is performing it. In the Bible, we find the word magicians quite often. The Hebrew word is shartumim. In Aramaic, it's very close. It's shartumin. So this word, the, the, the practice, the known profession of magicians is, cons is consciously known in scripture through the nations that are around the people of God. In the Greek, it's called the word magos. The English words magician and magic come from the Greek word magos that is found in the New Testament. Now, where does this word magos come from? It comes from a name that is given to a profession called magi, M-A-G-I. And magi or magians, these are people who were performing priestly functions in the Persian Median uh, dynasty, which we call the Irani Iranian people today. So my friends, these magos exercised functions as if they were religious people. So you can understand how magic, magicians are closely related to priestly functions, those who are called people of God, those who are called working with the spirits. This is closely related magic, magicians, and the people of God. So the question we need to ask ourselves, my friends, for those who practice magic, the Bible uses names such as sorcerers, witches, soothsayers. Why do we find this culture in Bible times? We know that nations around and many other religions practiced magic or witchcraft. Let's take Egypt for an example. When Pharaoh wanted the interpretation of his dream, he called his magicians in Genesis 41 and verse 8. When Aaron threw down his rod, his staff, before Pharaoh, Pharaoh called his own magicians and sorcerers. When Aaron's rod became a snake, he called his sorcerers and magicians to do the same in Exodus 7 and verse 11. So here we have Moses and Aaron working miracles, and here we have Pharaoh calling his sorcerers and magicians who use formulas and rituals to perform supernatural events. They are doing the same thing. So together, juxtaposed is the power of God in miracles and the working power of the forces of supernatural spirits. In Babylon, in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 20, Nebuchadnezzar compared his magicians to Daniel and his three friends. So all I'm saying right now, friends, is that Egypt and Babylon were nations that practiced the magical arts, the witchcraft, sorcery, they knew of these practices, and these people were given very good standing in any kingdom. So, my friends, when God's people were to enter into Canaan, the promised land, what did God say to them? God showed them and told them, do not behave like these people. The Canaanites practiced magic in even historical excavations, they have found magic wands and amulets and objects used in magical art when they did excavations in Palestine. The people of Palestine, the Canaanites, where the people of God were to go to enter the promised land, they practiced magical arts. So not just the Bible is identifying it, but even history is identifying it. 
another historian tells us that in the New Testament times, there were Jewish sorcerers and magicians who were all over the Greek or Roman world. So from the Greek Greeks to the Romans, God's people, the Jewish people, some of them found themselves being magicians and practicing the magical arts that you can find in history books. So I'm saying to you today, my friends, God's people mingled with the culture around them and they mingled with the magical arts around them. They mingled with sorcery. They mingled with witchcraft. So today, as we continue to understand the scripture, we recognize that we will find in the scripture things that are pertaining to God's people, but the source comes from the nations and the religions around and outside of God's people. So from the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Canaanites, God's people learned magical arts. You know, God knew what was going to happen when they would enter the promised land. And he said in Leviticus 20 and verse 27, he told them, the, the law of Moses placed under the pain of death those who practiced these kinds of things. So the question is, did God's people practice it? Did God approve of it? And here is what the, the, the Bible says. A man or a woman who is known to be a medium or a spiritist who works with spirits, spirits of the dead, with, with demons. If you find anyone amongst you, put that person to death, you are to stone them. Their blood will be on their own heads. That was how God and God's people looked at those who worked witchcraft, who worked magical arts. Now, I'm not asking you to, to do that today, to go out and stone people, because that was the indication for the cultural mindset of those people in the time of the Old Testament. Today, Jesus has taught us something different in our culture and in our mindset. He has shown us a better way. He says, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. He says, do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So I'm not asking you to go and throw stones. I'm just sharing with you what was the cultural reaction in the time of Moses, in the time of that culture, to those who worked magical arts. And they were warned in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 to 13, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or who practices witchcraft, or soothsaying, who, who interprets omens, and, or a sorcerer. Or one who conjures spells and, and a medium and a spiritist. Or one who calls upon the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord God drives them out from before you. So my friends, <clears throat> I'm establishing today from the word of God. That the magical arts, soothsaying, omens, a sorcerer, a witchcraft. All these things are not of God. I'm establishing today, my friends, that God condemns these things. God loves the sinner, but God condemns actions of the sinner and calls the sinner to repentance. God showed us that in Old Testament times, he condemned these things. And so God's people, if they were found doing these things, it was not by approval of God. So my friends, this is very important for us to understand. So Paul, when he preached to the Gentiles and they became converted, ask ourselves the questions, what should we do if when we are converted to knowing God and trusting in the power of God, but we used to practice magical arts. We used to practice witchcraft. We used to consult the spirits of the dead. What should we do? 
Well, here we have in Acts chapter 19, an example of what they did. The Bible says in Acts chapter 19, verses 18 and 20, and many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds, talking about what they used to do. Also, many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. I'm saying to you today, my friends, when God's people come to know God, even if they were practicing magical arts, even if they were soothsayers and consulting the spirits of the dead, when they found God, they gave it up all. God's people who believe in him by faith and trust in him cannot simultaneously consult demons and consult the spirits, consult soothsayers and mediums to call upon some kind of evil force for their benefit because it is not in harmony with God. Paul the Apostle listed in Galatians chapter 5, what he calls sorcery is the same thing as magical arts, is the same thing as witchcraft, is the same thing as calling up the dead, doing all kinds of evil work with the evil forces. He says those who practice these things cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I'm saying to you, my friends, therefore it is a call from God that even if we live in a culture that practices soothsaying, that consults the dead, consults the spirit, that consults mediums. These practices are not in harmony with God because these practices are calling upon evil forces, demons, to do their work. So I want to present to you miracles. Miracles worked by the power of God and not by demons. You know, the Bible says, <clears throat> sorry, the Bible says a miracle is a sign, a token, an omen. It's a wonder. A miracle in the Greek is the power of God. It is also called the dunamis. It's the deed of power. It is a sign coming out of a wonder. It's amazing. It's unexplainable. That's why the English word miracle is coined from the Latin word miraculum, meaning an object of wonder, a wonder. It's a wonderful thing, a strange thing, a marvel, a marvelous thing. It's something to wonder at, to be astonished, and to be amazed at. And therefore, a miracle is understandably a supernatural event in human affairs. A miracle cannot be explained on the basis of human logic or natural laws known to man. A miracle is one that cannot be expected in normal circumstances. So when Isaiah, when Elijah, sorry, put that stick, threw that stick in the Jordan, and the axe which was at the bottom, an iron axe, axe which is so heavy, floats to the top and stays there so that the young man could go and take it. That is not explainable in any natural law. That's what we call a miracle. But then there's a problem, my friends. Satan also is able to do miracles. The Bible tells us, in Exodus chapter 7, in uh, Acts chapter 8, in Revelation chapter 13, chapter 19, that Satan is able to do miracles. So how do we know, know the difference? We have the story that was dealt with on Wednesday night. Whose side are you on? You can go and check it out. And in that story, we see that the spirit of a demon was able to bend the back of a woman. So we are saying to you today, my friends, coming out of that story, 
that if Satan can do things to people with evil spirits, he can also work in the reverse to take that evil spirit out and to make it look like a miracle. Let me say that again, my friends. If Satan can cause things to happen to you and to things, he can do the inverse by making it look like it's a miracle when his workers pronounce spells and formulas. Now, let me get that straight. I'm not saying that Jesus' healing of this woman is a fake. That is a miracle. That's a deliverance from the spirit, the evil spirit that was within her. But a lesson to learn from it is that it is possible for Satan to do something and undo it. In another sense, where he can fool people today to make them believe that as his people go out in the world and create rituals and, and spells and, and formulas and things happen and it looks like a miracle, he will draw people to him and to his workers and to his power and people will believe it is the power of God. So my friends, John warned us in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 that we as Christians, we must try the spirits to know if they are of God. We must have discernment. Try the spirit. Don't just take what someone says. Try the spirit to know if it is of God. Deception is very easy, my friends. We need to know what we are doing. You see, the real problem is what, we, what you think or do about evil spirits, meaning demons, or what people say about it. That's the real problem. What do you do? What do you do with what people say and what people do? That's where the discernment comes in. You have to try the spirit. You know, there are many things that happen in our modern life today that show that we may not be discerning what's happening. For example, when I say I'm wearing a necklace or a ring or keeping an object that was given to me before a friend or a, a family member passed away, and I say I'm keeping it for charm, I'm keeping it for fortune, I'm keeping it for the presence of the person to be with me because this person was a good person. Which power are we depending on to help us because we keep that object? Which power are we depending on through that object to give us fortune, to give us luck, to give us chance, to make us successful, to have the presence of the person. The Bible says the dead knows nothing. They have no thought, they know love, no hate. They can do nothing under the sun in Ecclesiastes chapter nine. But what are we depending on through that object and through that power to make us something good or to give us some kind of benefit? You know, my friends, when someone says to you, keep this at all times, keep it on you. Don't separate yourself from it. It will bring you success. I'm asking you, my friends, what power are you depending on? I'm saying to you the only rule that will help you not to be deceived is the word of God. God's people must depend on the word of God. Now, I want to talk to you about miracles. An examination of the miracles performed by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is going to show us something different. You see, a miracle is a supernatural event that cannot be explained. We mentioned there's no logical reasoning. There's no way it can be defined by natural laws. So Jesus had a purpose when he did miracles. It's not just for the pleasure, but he had a purpose. And one of the things we need to recognize in the purpose of Christ 
is that he never exercised divine power for his own benefit. He never exercised divine power to satisfy curiosity. And I'm saying to you, my friends, this is a great problem amongst people. A lot of people want to be satisfied so that their curiosity can be satisfied, but not that they want to exercise faith in God. You know, when uh, the Pharisees came and said, show me a sign in Luke chapter, in Matthew chapter 16, show me a sign so that we can believe. Jesus says, a wicked and adulterous nation seeks after a sign. And no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Jesus does not give in to the desire of curiosity. A lot of people ask questions to you today out of curiosity. It is not worth answering. A lot of people today seek information, not for the glory of God, but just to satisfy their own curiosity and then walk away and go all over the place and to just keep chattering. Jesus didn't do miracles to satisfy curiosity or for his own benefit. You know, when Herod wanted a sign in Luke chapter 23, Jesus didn't answer a word. Jesus did not answer a word. The second thing we need to know about the miracles of Jesus is that he answered a specific material or physical need. He observed people and out of love and sympathy and care, he responded to their needs. The third thing we need to know about Jesus's miracle is that there is something about a spiritual teaching as he works his miracles. In Mark chapter 2, we understand when they were reasoning in their hearts about the miracle of Jesus, about when he said, arise, take up thy bed and walk. Jesus says, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, take up your bed and walk. But I say to you, so that the Son of Man may be known that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, arise, take up your bed and walk. It simply means that Christ used that miracle to show people that he has the authority to forgive sins. He has the divine authority, not just the divine authority to forgive, but he has the divine authority to work miracles. So here's a man who had no medical attention. He was not given any medication. He was lying there crippled for how many years? Jesus says, arise, take up thy bed and walk. So my friends, we must understand that people will follow Christ for signs. People will follow wanting to see wonders. People like to be satisfied in the eyes and the pleasure of the eyes to be satisfied in their curiosity. When he fed the, 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 the 5,000, they came back after him in John 6. And Jesus says to them, I know you are looking after me, verse 11 and onwards. But you're not coming after me because you want to follow me because you had fish and bread. But I'm telling you, don't labor for the things that perish, but labor for the food which endures to eternal life. Jesus was teaching through his miracles that we must go to the spiritual lesson that is behind the miracle. I know Jesus wanted faith to be inspired in the hearts of his people. In John chapter 11, when he talked about raising Lazarus and he's the resurrection and the life. And Mary said to them, said to him, I know that in the last days there shall be the resurrection. And Jesus said to her in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Though he may die, he shall live. And God, whoever lives and whoever lives, my friend, believes in me shall never die. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Jesus says? 
She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who has come into the world. So here, Jesus is teaching through the power of his miracles, profound truths about himself that he is the resurrection and the life. And, and through scriptures, my friends, as we wind down through scriptures, he has told of his miracles and asked people to recognize him as the Messiah and his divine authority through the mighty works that he does. And when sincere people recognize the miracles of God, they will recognize who God is. The Bible says that when they came from the Mount of Transfiguration and that father with his boy at the foot of the mountain was possessed and Jesus worked the miracle and delivered that boy. The Bible says that they were all amazed at the majesty of God in Luke chapter 9 and verse 43. They were amazed. God wants people to be inspired to faith in him, to trust in him through miracles. It's not to satisfy curiosity. It's not for our personal benefits. It is not for our personal glory. It is to satisfy God's glory and people being inspired to faith in Jesus. You see, those who work magic, those who work magic and soothsayers and mediums, they inspire trust in themselves. They inspire people to pay them. They inspire people to look to them but God inspires people to glorify him as the God who gives life eternal, who forgives a sin, who loves and cares and needs no money from us to work for our good. So my friends, those who want miracles in their lives, they must have faith. And we recognize that it's because of unbelief that the disciples could not free that boy from the demon. Jesus says it's unbelief in Matthew chapter 70. We recognize that there must be active cooperation as we work with God in the process of working miracles in our lives. You know, when we recognize the story of Matthew chapter 17, where the tax collectors from the temple came and said, don't your master pay tax as they spoke to Peter. And Jesus says not to offend them. Go to the seashore, drop your hook, and the first fish that comes up opens its mouth and you shall open its mouth and you shall find a piece of coin and give it to them. Jesus invited Peter to participate in the miracle. And there are times when God is calling us to participate actively in the miracle he wants to do in our lives. First, it's faith. And second, our faith must be active enough to obey. And then we must have the willingness, the willingness, my friends, to live in harmony with God. When Jesus found the man that he said to Take up your bed and walk in John, John chapter 5. He saw him again in verse 14 and he said to him, Hey, see you have been made well. Sin no more or a worse thing could come upon you. Jesus inspires us that as we have seen the marveling power of God and have trusted in him to obey, continue to live the life of obedience according to to God's word. And from there, he says, that, like he said to the man who was demon possessed on the seashore of Gennesaret, he says, hey, Jesus, can I come with you? And Jesus says, no, go back and tell your friends what God has done for you. And that the man did. And people were amazed. So God has purposes for doing miracles. It's not for self-interest. It's not to glorify ourselves, but it is for the glory of God. So my friends, we need to know that out of all the miracles of Christ, he did it for the glory of God, for people to trust in him as the savior of the world, as the savior from sin. 
It's not to make us rich and to sit in luxury and evil practices, but it is for us to know the God who saves us from our sins. So you see the power of the Holy Spirit, my friends, is who works miracles. First Corinthians chapter 12 tells us there are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. And it's the same spirit who gives to one working of miracles. It's not something that everybody jumps up and, and goes and do. The working of miracles is a gift from the spirit of God. And he gives to others miracles. He gives to others prophecy. He gives to others all kinds of different gifts. So nobody needs to be jealous about someone who works gifts, miracles. And nobody needs to feel less fortunate from God that their gift is not the gift of miracle. You see, the television today have made it such a big thing that if you don't know how to work miracles, then you are not of God. And you're not powerful enough. You don't have enough faith. But I'm saying to you, my friends, working miracles is a gift. And as you go through the process with God and his purpose, God will work miracles as he chooses in the circumstances that he desires. Let us not be consumed by the fantasy and, the, and, 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 and all the glittering that goes on around miracles. So my friends, nobody can appropriate to themselves that this is my power that I'm great and I'm powerful and I'm wonderful and I'm next to God because I work miracles. You know, many people believe that they can buy their way into the kingdom. And so with their money, they seek to gain from God powers. And most of the times they think they're getting it from God. And so they work magical powers. And those powers are coming from the enemy. In Acts chapter 8, the Bible tells us that Simon, when he saw that the apostles were laying their hands upon people and people were receiving the Holy Spirit, he offered them money and said, give me that power too. But here is what Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent of this, your wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. Here the Bible teaches that the apostles recognize that the working of magical arts is not of God. So Old Testament, just like New Testament, condemns these magical practices where you use formulas and rituals and soothsayers and mediums and witchcraft to call up spirits to work on your behalf or even to do evil to someone. And, God, and, and Peter says, hey, this is not of God. What you need to do is repent. A call is given to all in the hearing of the voice. In the hearing of the voice of God, in the reading of the word of God, give up magical arts that work with demonic powers and turn to God and the Holy Spirit in your life that can work on your behalf to free you from sin and to make sure you are sustained into eternal life. My friends, Jesus has made a promise that he works with the power of God. Jesus has made a promise that he works on her behalf. Jesus has made a promise that all who come to him will find rest to their souls. I'm telling you, my friends, that there are many people who have hooked themselves to demonic forces and soothsayers. There are many who have hooked themselves to all kinds of plans and engagements with evil forces and witchcraft and they have got demons within them and every day they seek to be released but they cannot be released because only God can release you of demons 
I'm saying to you, my friends, come to God. Repent of your sins and come to God. God works with divine power and not with the magical arts of evil forces. You know, we speak about the Old Testament and the New Testament, but even in modern times, we know God works miracles. You have seen God working miracles in your life. You've seen God working miracles in the lives of others. I've seen God working miracles in my life. I've seen God working miracle in the lives of others. Miracles of God are being worked every single day. For God is not in the show off business is in the salvation business of saving his children. So I say to you today, my friend, as a father or a mother out there, you pray for your child who within seconds is suddenly stricken by reddish bumps on skin and face. And you pray and within seconds, those bumps are gone. I'm saying we are talking about a miracle working power where there are witnesses who saw the rising of those bumps all over and prayed together and those bumps disappeared as quickly as they came. I'm talking about the miracle working power of God. I've been witness to it. When your child slips and hits a, a table, which is a glass table, and there's a blue contusion on the face, and you say to the child and gather the child and you say, pray and ask God to take that away. And within seconds, as you walk away, that blue is gone. A blue represents rupture of blood vessels under the skin. And within seconds, it's gone. I'm saying we are talking about the miracle working power of God. And I've been witness to the miracle working power of God. My friends, I'm saying to you, when a parent calls a pastor or an elder or a brother or a sister and says, my child is sick, just laying there sick and you pray. And as immediately as you pray, the child is up and running about in full health. I'm talking about the miracle working power of God. We do not need demonic forces. We do not need soothsayers and mediums. We do not need sorcerers. We do not need magicians and witchcraft and witches because we have the power of God that is available to us. And even if God's people in the past have mingled themselves with demonic forces in voodoo and obia and all kinds of black magic, I'm saying to you today, my friends, we don't need to be afraid of them and we don't need to consult them because God is able to work in our lives. I consult God for my needs. I consult the Spirit of God for my needs. I consult the Father for my needs. I don't need the enemy. And I say to you, my friends, I wish you the same. I pray that you will do the same. Call upon God. And before you call, he will leave an answer. So today, my friends, depend on the power of God. It's available. It is available through the Holy Spirit. May God help you, my friends. If you want to be delivered from these demonic forces, if you want to be delivered from the hold of, the, of, of, of magical arts, if you want to be delivered I invite you to turn your hearts to Jesus right now and bow your heads as we pray. In your heart, call upon Jesus. Say to him, strengthen my faith, O God. Forgive me of my sins and deliver me from demonic forces. De deliver me from practices that I have been doing innocently without even knowing that I'm depending on demonic forces. I say, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, according to your loving kindness, according to your wonderful grace and mercy and your compassion, may you grant unto those in the hearing of your word 
deliverance, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. May God bless you, my friends. Until next time. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for thy holy Sabbath day and for the blessings that you have lavished on us today through your words from your manservant. As we go through the remainder of this day, we ask for your blessings and your peace to abide with us. Thank you for everything that you have done for us. Pray that you will hear our prayers and that you will bless all the mothers of our church and mothers around the world. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus.